And so welcome to this nightly presentation where we are continuing to look at uh, family life. And uh, today we are looking at uh, the salvation of infants and imbeciles, salvation of infants and imbeciles. This is something that uh, has troubled people. What shall be with my child? What shall be with aborted children? What shall be with the infants who die without uh, uh, reaching an age where they can choose to do right or wrong? And uh, there is not much that uh, is revealed in the Bible, but uh, I'll borrow from uh, the writings of uh, Sister White on what she has to speak uh, about this subject, because um, one of the questions that uh, have arisen is uh, why did even God decide to destroy the children of Amalekites who had uh, done nothing wrong and this uh, have left uh, many people with uh, many, many questions. But uh, I won't have an answer for everything, but just go through some sharing and uh, leave it where the inspiration leaves it. And so the salvation of uh, infants and imbeciles. Um, some have uh, some question whether the little children of even believing parents should be saved because they have had no test of character and all must be tested and their character determined by trial. The question is asked, how can little children have this test and trial? I am that the faith of the believing parents covers the children as when God sent his judgment upon the firstborn of the Egyptians. Whether all the children of unbelieving parents will be saved, we cannot tell because God has not made known his purpose in regard to this matter and we had a better leave it where God has left it and dwell upon the subjects made plain in his word. And so first she says that um, the faith of the parents covers the children as it were in the firstborns of Egypt. But later she says, we, know, we do not know if all will be saved. There is a remarkable story of um, the child A where she says, in regard to the case of A, you see him as he now is and deplore his simplicity. He is without the consciousness of sin. And uh, we have to understand the context and uh, the background of this quote. In a little while, I'll be giving it to you. In regard to the case of A, you see him as he now is and deplore his simplicity. He is without the consciousness of sin. The grace of God will remove all this hereditary transmitted imbecility. You remember my title is The Salvation of Infants and Imbeciles. Now, this child, A, he has this simplicity and he is without the consciousness of sin. And we are told the grace of God will remove all this hereditary transmitted imbecility and will have an inheritance among the saints in light. To you, the Lord has given reason. Now, who is to you? We shall see. He is a child as far as the capacity of reason is concerned, but he has the submission and obedience of a child. Now, just to rehash this, this A is a child as far as reason is concerned because he is an imbecile, but he has the submission and obedience of a child. He was not just a child a little child, but he was uh, somehow a grown-up, but he was an imbecile. Now, if you're wondering what is uh, an uh, an imbecile, um, an imbecile is uh, an extremely stupid person. And uh, the noun imbecile is used uh, informally as an insult to mean fool. It is origins are in the Latin word imbecile, that is weak or feeble, and it was an official medical term for people with specific and a low IQ in the 19th and early 20th century. So 
as it is used to the child A that he is an imbecile. It is not just an extreme stupid person, but uh, he was a child with low IQ. Now, let me give you a background of this. Um, let me give you a background of this child A uh, because um, we must understand where we are going and we are coming from because we are looking at the salvation of uh, infants and imbeciles. First of all, we have been told that um, whether God will save all infants who have died without reaching a test of character, we do not know. But uh, the children of the godly parents are, 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 are covered by their parents and uh, are, as it were in the firstborns of Egypt. But whether all will be saved, we do we, not know. Then there is the case of A. We had a family of uh, a sister in Brother Brown and uh, Sister White was writing to Sister Brown in New Zealand back in uh, 1893, who had uh, three children, that is Andrew, John, and Mary. Now, it's good to get this background so that we may understand why this child became an imbecile and we can revisit uh, the, the care of the mother before, during, and after pregnancy is so important. How did this child A become an imbecile? This child A, it, his name is called John, and he had a brother who is called Andrew and a sister who is called Mary. The father to, to Andrew, John, and Mary, who is brother Brown, was a drunkard and used liquor so much so that um, the children that were born to this family, they... They, 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 they were born with mental retardedness. They, they, their mental capacity, even as they grew to children, never developed well because the father drank so much and this affected the mother. So the child A, who is John, became an imbecile. And um, the other child who is called Andrew actually uh, started also using liquor and poisonous substances because of the inheritance they received from the father. Now, Andrew was uh, the eldest uh, son in the family. And so Sister White was writing to Sister Brown and Andrew and talking to them about uh, being able to take care of this child, Mary and Andrew, who were left uh, uh, in, in that family. I think the father died. Uh, I can't trace the, the, the story so well, but uh, either the father died or the, he, he left uh, the, the family, but uh, he was a, a strong alcoholic. And so Andrew um, uh, inherited the appetite of liquor and poisonous substances. And he was the, uh, 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 the eldest uh, child in that family. But then Andrew took Mary with him to raise him up. But Sister White was advising Andrew to take Mary back to the mother, Sister Brown, because of the life Andrew was living. And then he, he started writing to the mother, Sister Brown, telling her that uh, she should be able to take care of the children which are still living because others had died because of, um, uh, 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 um, uh, of, uh, uh, of the weakness of the body they had inherited from uh, the, the, the father and all that. And so Andrew, who was the eldest uh, and was with Mary, was being told that um, he should have been uh, uh, let the sister Mary to the watch care of uh, the mother, and uh, he should have not separated the, the, this uh, sister with, with the mother so that she may be able to uh, uh, take care of her. And then uh, Sister White talking to Andrew, uh, Say, tell him that uh, he has inherited the appetite for wine and stimulating drinks. And uh, uh, they, they, there was a yielding to uh, a temptation and anger and the moral powers of Andrew had gone. And it was affecting also the young sister, which was Mary. Again, uh, she told uh, Sister Brown, who was the mother of Andrew, Mary and John, that uh, uh, since she had known the effects of liquor and poisonous substances, she should have taken steps to make sure that the children are raised up in uh, a way that uh, they would be 
acceptable, even though they had inherited some imbecility in their lives. And so um, the father lived a very terrible life and he had a, a habit of uh, uh, strong drink. And so um, John, who is the child A that we are reading, I'll just project um, that once again, the, the child John, and uh, see what uh, Sister White says again. I'll just reread this. That uh, in regard to the case of A, you see him as he now is and deploy his simplicity. He is without the consciousness of sin. How is this child without the consciousness of sin? He was an imbecile. He had a low IQ because of the hereditary he had received from the father who had a habit of strong drinks, liquor, and wine. And so she says the grace of God will remove all this hereditary those things, those traits that he had inherited from the father, uh, uh, God will remove them. Uh, uh, the grace of God will remove all the hereditary transmitted in personality and he will have an inheritance among the saints in light. It's like Sister White never saw the future of this child living upon the face of the earth, but saw that she will also die as even other children of this family died. And talking about... Uh, talking to Andrew, she, she went ahead to say, to you, Andrew, the Lord has given reason. This is the eldest son in that family. John, who is A, is a child as far as the capacity of reason is concerned. Now, so the children, this, this uh, caught my attention that children, uh, when they are born, actually, they have no consciousness of sin somehow because she's saying john is a child as far as the capacity of prison is concerned and in earlier part he says that uh, he is without the consciousness of sin so he's he had a low iq to the extent that he could not have consciousness of sin and as even uh although he were a, a, a much an older child but uh, he is being referred here as a child when it concerns reason. But he has the submission and obedience of a child. Even though he had a low IQ, uh, this child had no consciousness of sin and he had an obedience and submission of a child. This is the state of children when they are born. And I wouldn't enter into the debate of uh, a children born with sin, a children born on probation, a children born on this and this. Uh, really, I have no time for that. And uh, maybe you, the people who are concerned with these things can handle them. But this quote is sufficient enough for me to make some conclusion about infants that uh, they have they, they, they have no consciousness of sin. So we, we, whichever that means, uh, John didn't have that and uh, uh, he has the capacity of a child as reasoning. So uh, just going back to this um, uh, history that um, um, Sister White writing to John uh, he tells him uh, uh, that uh, he has an advantage over, over, over writing to Andrew. He says that he has an advantage over John because uh, him, when he, he had uh, an, uh, he, he had an advantage of growing up without being affected by the hereditary of the father, but uh, now these little ones uh, have been affected by the habits of the father. And even some of the children in this family, uh, when you go to the history in 1893, uh, you find that uh, she says that uh, uh, many of the children of that family are not living. They did not live to testify by the physical and mental degeneracy, the sins of the father. They died when they were infant. And as she looked at Andrew, she saw that as she looked at uh, as she looked at John, she saw that this child was not going to have uh, to, uh, she, uh, many days on the face of the earth. Um, and so uh, she goes ahead and tell Andrew, who is the eldest son, that um, he has a weightier responsibility to cooperate with heaven and make sure that uh, he lives in accordance with the word of God because him, he have reason. But uh, Mary and 
John have no mental capacity and consciousness of sin, which will require the submission of somebody who is not uh, an imbecile. And so Sister White talking to uh, Andrew, he tells him that you have an advantage in every respect to John, but uh, if you practice uh, a life of disobedience and transgression, uh, the life, uh, immortal life, which uh, will be given to John and Mary, who are suffering from imbecility through hereditary, will not be given to you while it will be given to John and Mary. And so the, the salvation of infants and imbeciles, I like to repeat uh, what she said, that whether all will be saved, we do not know. This was a special case which was revealed to Sister White that these two children, John and Mary, although imbeciles because of heredity, God will give them immortal life. And unto the children of the believing ones, she says that um, the parents cover them as it were the children of the firstborns in Egypt. Also, there is um, a passage in uh, 1 Corinthians, in the 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 7, I like just to, when talking about uh, the children of believing parents, uh, this is what we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, it is in verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 14. I want to look at verse 14, the children of believing parents. But uh, I'm not saying that all the children of believing parents will be saved. This is These are just special cases, and we have not to conclude everything based on isolated text. And so we are told in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were, children, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Very interesting that uh, the believing parent covers the children and even the husband, but to what extent? When the children reaches uh, uh, an age of taste and consciousness of sin, the believing parents do not cover them. And uh, this is a mystery that uh, a believing husband or wife covers their spouse. In which way? So that um, you see in Malachi chapter 2, we are told that God is looking for a godly seed. And so even though the father or the mother may be wayward, one who is believing actually covers the husband in the respect of supplying for the seed that is polluted so that uh, it may be purified so that the children which are born are covered with the holiness of uh, the, the believing spouse. Uh, and uh, I like to talk about 1 Corinthians 7, 14 in detail. Uh, but um, uh, I won't be able to do that because that is not uh, my target uh, this, uh, in this presentation. But uh, look at Malachi chapter 2. And uh, I look at uh, verse 15. And did not he make one, yet had he the residue of the Spirit? And wherefore one, that he, may, he might seek a godly seed? Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of the youth. So God is in the business of seeking a godly seed. And where uh, there is a spouse that is believing and another one is not believing, the Lord will make uh, the, the seed of the believing one be able to have power over the seed of unbelieving spouse. And then the children are counted holy in that sense. But uh, there is much more in this when you come to anatomy and physiology of uh, looking at this verse, uh, chapter two, verse 15, uh, when the, the two seeds meet and uh, the spark of life as, uh, uh, just look at the book of John, uh, the book of John, chapter uh, one, look at the book of John chapter one and uh, very interesting story here. Um, in uh, verse uh, four, 
of John chapter 1, in him was life and the life was the light of men. So this life is also the light of men. And when you go to verse 9, it says that that was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into this world. Simply, this light giveth life or the life giveth light, whichever way. And so during the, the coming together of seed, there is a light or the warmth that actually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gives life to these two seeds that are enjoining themselves together. It is the life and the light of the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world, and that is Jesus Christ. So if we have a believing spouse, the life of Jesus Christ is the light, life that sparks the light that gives life to the seed of the fetus so that the child may start developing in the womb of the baby the womb of the mother, sorry. And so uh, uh, this is, uh, those who study the anatomy and physiology can understand this, uh, what happens during the, the seeds coming together so that the child may start developing what I'm talking about. And so you may ask, and if that is the case, what about the unbelieving children? Doesn't God give them life or light? But um, in the book of Malachi, Malachi, we have just read that um, yet had he the residue of the spirit. Now, children, we have an example of children who are filled with the spirit of God from the womb. We have Jesus Christ. We have Samson. We have um, uh, also John the Baptist. They were filled with the spirit of God from their mother's womb. But they are children who or uh, the, the, the seed of the evil, actually they are just given a spark of life, not the spiritual life. They are given a spark of life. And uh, uh, I wouldn't go into details about this, but uh, 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 we are told that God does not dwell in the heart of a sinner. And so he gives everyone a spark of life that is the natural life to make the blood run and then live. And then there is the spiritual life that is given to somebody. That is the, the traits of character are passed to children by uh, the spirit in their parents because there is a residue of the spirit which is given to these children. And it will depend if and when we go broadly in the word spirit, actually, one way it is life and another way it is character. So the character of the parent is also passed on the children. The heredity, their weaknesses and all this, they are passed on the children as um, a, a character. But also there is life that God allows the everyone that comes in this world to have. So there are children who are filled with the spirit of God from the womb. And there are children who in the Bible, we have been told like the children of Amalekite, they inherited the spirit of their parents. And if they could have been given a chance to live, they could have destroyed the children of Israel. So God ordered Saul to destroy them. Also, we have the sons of Eli. Actually, they were the sons of Belial. But you say Eli was a godly parent. How is it that the children were children of Belial? That uh, uh, when, when you go back to conflict and courage, we are told that Eli, although a godly parent, did not raise up the children in the right way, and so they became the children of Belial. But enough with that, the salvation of imbeciles and uh, uh, infants and imbeciles. I go back to the quote. And uh, that is just a little bit uh, behind the story of uh, in regard of A, that is John and the brother Andrew and the sister Mary. Now, the Lord com commanded Saul to utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. The Lord knew that this wicked nation would, if it were possible, blot out this, his people and his worship from the earth. And for this reason, he had commanded that even the little children should be cut off. And so you, you now see why God decided that even the children 
should be blotted out because if they lived, they had imbibed the spirit of their ungodly parent and they could have done away with the nation of Israel. The Lord loved those little children who tried to do right and he has promised that they shall be in his kingdom. We are looking at the life of the infants and imbeciles. But wicked children God does not love. He will not take them to the beautiful city for, the only, for he only admits the good, obedient and patient children there. Uh, and this is um, appeal to the youth, page 61, paragraph 3. In Child Guidance, page 87, paragraph 5, if there is something to be addressed today, it's in it, today is the family circle, which is the first church before registering membership with any other church. If we don't get it right at home, it will be more hard to make it right in the church. Let us not allow the beginning of all evil be charged in the books of heaven to the neglect of our parenthood. Again, in uh, in uh, in Revealed Herald, July 16, 1895, paragraph 3, we read that uh, how much corruption we see in the world because parents neglect to do their duty and sin lies at the door. Satan stands by exalting as you permit your children to pass into his hands. Do not indulge your children in evil ways, but from their very infancy, let them see that you love the Lord and that you mean to train them up as he will have you. Our blessed Savior taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do we realize what is the meaning of this prayer? Do we realize that we must hallow that name in our families and that if we allow our children to manifest the attributes of Satan, that name is not hallowed in our households. If we want the holy angels to take charge of our little ones, we must bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and teach them to hallow the name of God. We teach them to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is written in heaven. But you teach them the meaning of this prayer. You teach them that the kingdom of God must be seen in your household and that he will and that the will of God must be done by them and you. Do you break the force of this petition by shaking them, by striking them in anger, by speaking harsh words, and by manifesting passion? Suppose one of your little children whom you have failed to correct should be taken away in one of it, of it is fits of temper. What should be the result? I leave you to answer the question. Again, in child garden 82.6, few parents begin early enough to teach their children obedience. The child is usually allowed to get two or three years the start, three years the start of its parents, who forbear to discipline it, thinking it is too young to learn to obey. But all this time, self is growing strong in little being, and every day makes it a harder task for the parent to gain control of uh, the child. So, we are admonished in child guiding 82.7. At every age, at a very early age, children can comprehend what is plainly and simply told them, and by kind and judicious management can be taught to obey. The mother should not allow her child to gain an advantage over her in a single instant, and in order to maintain this authority, it is not necessary to resort to harsh measures. A firm, steady hand and a kindness which convince the child of their love will accomplish the purpose. But let selfishness, anger, and self-will have their cause for the first three years of child's life, and it will be hard to, to bring it to submit to wholesome discipline. This evil tendencies grow with its growth until in manhood, supreme selfishness and the lack of self-control place him at the mercy of the evils that run riot in our land. Continued on, the little ones, before they are a year old, hear and understand what is spoken in reference to themselves and know to what extent they are to be indulged. Your children quickly learn just what you expect of them. They know when their will conquers you yours and will make the most of their victory and uh, I looked at uh, that uh, and uh, I'll just skip over that uh, quote. In Child Guidance 561.4, when parents and children meet at the final reckoning, we are looking at the salvation of uh, infants and imbeciles. When parents and children meet at the final reckoning, what a scene will be presented. Thousands of children who have been slaves to appetite and debasing vice whose lives are moral wrecks will stand to face uh, will stand face to face with the parents who made them what they are. Now this means they will not be in heaven. They'll stand in the ranks of the wicked. Who but the parents must bear this fearful responsibility. So parents will bear this fearful responsibility, but the children will be also on their side. 
Did the Lord make this youth corrupt? Oh no, he made them in his image, a little lower than angels. Who then has done the fearful work of forming the life character? Who changed their character so that they do not bear the impress of God and must be forever separated from his presence as too impure to have any place with the pure angels in holy heaven? Were the sins of the parents transmitted to the children in perverted appetites and passions? And was the work completed by the pleasure-loving mother in neglecting to properly train them according to the pattern given her? All these mothers will pass in review before God just as surely as they exist. Children plus their parents who have done these things will be lost and lost forever. Now, Many of the woes that plague the married ones are lack of each party understanding their roles in the family, hence crossing each other's fear, resulting into this content. And so we see that um, there is every duty that um, a parent and, uh, has to play in family life. And as we bring this to an end, I, I'd just like to point out the duties of a husband uh, in the life of uh, the young ones and uh, uh, the duty of uh, a mother uh, or a wife in the life of the young ones as they bring them to the admonition of the Lord. And then uh, in the next presentation, we shall be looking at uh, the awful, the awful work, the awful work of a married woman or a mother. And so in closing, let us look at the duties quickly of uh, uh, the husband and the duties of a wife, what role do they have to play in these younger children, the infants and the imbeciles? Uh, and uh, I not hope that uh, 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 a believer will bring forth an imbecile child unless there is some chronic illnesses with the spouses because um, that we have some chronic diseases in spouses which uh, affect the birth of the children and they are born imbeciles, not because um, they are addicts, they are uh, wicked or they are that, but uh, maybe they could have participated in wayward life before uh, meeting Christ and then they have been degenerated in physical or in their DNA. And so they give birth to a child which is an imbecile. So the duty of a husband, Genesis 2, 24, leave father and mother for a wife. Uh, he must make sure that uh, he provides an environment where actually the wife will be able to give birth to children which will produce a holy seed. Because in the first promise, we, we, we find that the seed of the woman shall uh, a bruise the head of the serpent. And we know that seed is Jesus Christ. And so he um, delegates those duties to the parents. As he gives them life, he expects them to pass the same life to these children so that they may be able to grow in a, a godly way. In Deuteronomy 13, 6 to 8, husband should never allow his wife to turn him from God. Remember, these are duties of the husband that uh, he should do everything to create an environment where children will be born that can uh, worship the Lord. And also he should never allow, allow his wife to turn him from God. That is uh, a seeking during the pregnancy, uh, the wife doing things which are not supposed to be done. And um, uh, you know that you are carrying a seed and uh, whatever environment you give to that seed, uh, either it will spread bring up in a healthy way or in an unhealthy way, just like it is in the gardening. If you give the seed an humble uh, environment, it will uh, produce much fruit. But uh, if you do not give it a, a good environment to grow, then that seed will not germinate into a good seed. So husband should never allow his wife to turn him from God or do things that are not um, uh, required in the Bible during pregnancy. First year of First year of married life, husband should remain at home and cheer up uh, his wife. And so this uh, really reduces mental uh, depression. And uh, 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 you find what is called uh, becoming one in mind, in everything. 
and uh, being able to uh, 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 know each other better so that uh, the affection may be developed. And uh, uh, in case of pregnancy, the child gets an environment where it is um, uh, 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 the, the, the mother and the father have become one. They are no longer two, but they have become one flesh. Proverbs 5.18, rejoice with his wife. And we are told that uh, Mary had um, uh, worked like a medicine. Ecclesiastes 9.9, live joyfully with her, the minister of healing, 3.75 and 3.75. Ephesians 5.25-23, love your wife even as Christ also loved the child and gave himself for it, the minister of healing, 3.60, that uh, everything will be done uh, for the glory of Christ and not for the glory of men. Uh, of the man who is the head of the family. Colossians 3, 19, be not bitter against the family. And uh, uh, this spirit of bitterness, it is something that uh, we have all to overcome because it exists at a, a very high, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, how can I term it? It permeates uh, Christendom so much. Uh, just leave it like that. Proverbs 1.28, commend and praise where due. And, uh, you know, in this one, if you do this, this is forming a character that will be passed on children. And so whatever character that you like the children to have, it is you can practice between you two before you get a child. Commanded praise where do one Peter 3 7 honor the wife, testimonies of the child. And we are told that so that our prayers may not be hindered. And this is a lesson of forgiveness um, that we get in First Peter 3 7. Malachi 2 14 and 15. God is a witness if any deal treacherously with their wives. And 1 Corinthians 7 12 to 16. Convert wife by godly life. This is the duty, the main duties of a husband, more so when they are preparing for the child during the pregnancy and even after the pregnancy so that um, uh, God may have a godly seed. And if the children die in infancy, we are told that uh, the believing parents uh, cover them as the firstborn of Egypt who are covered by their parents. Uh, the man who lives up to God's requirements will have a happy home. He can kneel with his wife and together their prayers will ascend and hinder to the throne. Um, the, the 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 above is taken from uh, Bible handbook by uh, Bible handbook by Haskell Stephen Nelson page uh, 62 the duty of a wife uh, this is the last portion Genesis 3 Genesis 3 6 17 to 24 the wife should never like Eve ask her husband to disobey God and uh, you know how women have cravings during their pregnancy. And these cravings, it's not because really there's craving, but it's lack of uh, some nutrients in the body. So if these nutrients are supplied, actually there will be no unnecessary demands and disobedience uh, to as Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Now you ask, what kind of nutrients was Eve not having? And it is... Uh, what was Eve really lacking? The spiritual aspect of it to stand by the word of God. Proverbs 12, 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. And Ephesians 5, 23, husband, the head of the wife. Ephesians wife, reverend the husband. Titus 2, love and obey the husband. In Colossians 3, 18, wives submit yourself unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord, not as it is in fit in the eyes of men. If a husband commands a wife to disobey God, then obedience could not be fit in the Lord. Proverbs 19, 13, 21, 9. A contentious wife makes an unhappy home. And uh, you understand how Solomon says that uh, it will be better to live at the rooftop than to live with a contentious woman. And then Proverbs 21, 19, better dwell in the desert than with a, such a, a woman. And so, a husband can safely trust a virtuous woman who speaks kindly. And uh, Sister White says that uh, let the women make themselves a necessity to their husbands by their way of conduct and not uh, push them away from their lives. 1 Corinthians 7, 13 and 16, God life may win unbelieving husband. This is where we have seen that who knows whether the husband or the wife will win uh, uh, their spouses to heaven. 
And um, in Review and Herald, April 22, 1862, paragraph 11, we read, those who love may speak or act unguardedly, which may wound us deeply. Uh, it was not their intention to do this, but Satan magnifies their words and acts before uh, the mind in a manner by which he hurls a dart from his quiver to pierce us. We brace ourselves to resist the one whom we think has injured us, and thus we encourage Satan's temptation. Instead of praying to God for strength to resist us, Satan, we suffer our happiness to be marred by trying to stand for what we term our rights. In thus doing, we allow Satan a double advantage. We act out our grieved feelings, and by taking this course, Satan uses us as his agents to wound and distress those who did not intend to injure us. The requirements of the husband may sometimes seem unreasonable to the wife, when if she would take the second view of the matter, in as favorable a light for him as possible, if she would calmly, candidly consider, she will see that to yield her own way and submit to the judgment of her husband, even if it is con even if it conflicted with her feelings, will save them both from unhappiness and will give them great victory over the temptations of Satan. If uh, every woman was taught these principles by her parents, she would be careful to select for her husband a man she could reverence and obey, the Ministry of Healing 357-358. God takes the marriage re relation to represent connection between himself and his people. Ephesians 5, 31-33, Jeremiah 3, 14, Hosea 2, 19 and 20, Jeremiah 1, 32, taken from the Bible, handbook by Heskel Stephen Nelson, also pages 62 and 63. And so you can uh, see the environment that the husband and the wife must create for even these infants, if for an adventure, God forbid, that they die in infancy, that it may be said that the holiness of their parents was covering them and they can be admitted in heaven. If they were imbecile due to um, either one of the spouses not being okay, then the other spouse can cover this child and also, maybe if they were imbecile because of any chronic illnesses, but the parents are converted, this child can be admitted to heaven. Otherwise, I want to leave where inspiration leaves it and how I pray that um, we may be the people who will create such environment for our children if there are people who are still giving birth and if there are people who are still uh, having little children, that um, we may know what it partakes for a child to be in heaven and we may do our duty and leave the rest with the Lord. Otherwise, God bless us and uh, may we continue hoping in him, trusting that uh, he will accomplish that which he has started in our lives. And uh, God bless us. Uh, we shall be meeting in the next presentation. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, time. And uh, our prayer is that uh, you may help us be holy so that uh, we may pass the same traits that uh, we would want to see children have to them. And so thank you. And if there are big things that we have not done in our lives that we need to be doing, Lord, give us the grace to do them in Jesus' name. Amen.